talked about the clinical trials, but uh, could you, so you, you run clinical trials on like every product. Could you talk a little bit about um, how you run these and what, and, and more kind of more detail on what you measure? Cause I'd be interested, you, you said, you know, you measure the thickness and the, yeah. and, and the viscosity, you know, the viscosity and the softness of the skin. Yes, so the first clinical study that we did was with the face moisturizer. And the main question that we wanted to answer was, is the peptide adding something to that formula? Because we already have a very rich formula in terms of other ingredients as we we're sharing, but we want to see if the peptide was really uh, adding more efficacy and, and helping this skin rejuvenation. And what we found, so we did a split face. The, this first study was a split face, half of the face with the full formula without the peptide and half of the face with the formula containing the peptide. And the findings were very interesting. Uh, only the side that had the peptide, we could detect an improvement in the skin barrier using this instrument that we call vapometer that measure the transepidermal water loss. So basically, the, the stronger skin barrier, the less water you are going to uh, lose. Um, and was only on the side of the peptide. We also saw uh, a bigger improvements in terms of appearance on fine lines and wrinkles on the side of the peptide and other markers as well that decrease only on the side of the peptide. So I think it was very interesting to see that one peptide can actually have an impact in this whole mm -hmm. formula. And it's not something that other companies usually assess because it's a really hard result to get. And uh, we were very pleased that we could see significant difference between the two sides. And this is another manuscript that we just got accepted for publication. So it will probably be available in the next week or so. So we can definitely link <laughs> to this episode <laughs> okay. whenever it yeah. comes out. Uh, so that was the first clinical study that the goal was to assess, like, is the peptide adding value to this formula? So we, we realized that, yes. The second was with the body lotion, this one that I already shared, that, that mm. we want to assess how uh, treating your skin topically would impact your systemic levels of inflammation. Uh, this is also for publication. And the, the third one was on the eye uh, efficacy. So for the eye clinical study, we we're just comparing before and after, but we compared in three different ways. So the first one is a subjective analysis, how they, they the patients perceive the improvements in terms of hydration, fine lines, elasticity, firmness, and so on. The second way to analyze is a clinical grade evaluation. So a dermatologist that's trained to grade the, the level of your skin, we evaluate before and after three months, what was the improvement and they are blind. They also don't know which uh, uh, kind of patients in, were treated with, you know, with the product. And the final assessment that we have, it's a more objective assessment. So we collect images uh, through two uh, equipments, one called Visia, the other one is Antera. And that help us to, quant to be able to map the fine lines and to quantify um, the decrease of you know, fine lines and wrinkles. Also, you can see improvement in texture, in um, the pigmentation. So we can actually quantify those improvements through the, those images. And the final way to assess is using instruments. So there are some instruments that are uh, able to measure hydration. So a cutometer is one instrument that we use for hydration. And then we have this vapometer that's for measuring skin barrier. And uh, and we have another one for elasticity. So we love instruments because to us, they are the most reliable ones in the sense that it's quantitative. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it's it's everything that's not subjective. It's it's or that involves like a human kind of evaluating for us. It's a little more reliable. So we do all of these types of assessments in order to make sure that uh, we can um, confirm that the product is really making a change in their skin. Uh, so this one is also being prepared for publication. It's still not submitted, so it'll take a little bit longer, but should be submitted before the end of the half of the year. So we did this three for the peptide. We are we also running right now one very interesting that's about uh, that the goal is to measure the change in the skin biological age. So our hypothesis is that our peptide, by reducing the amount of senescent cells, can reverse the age of the skin. We have proven this in the lab. This is a this is published. Now we want to see how this translates to humans when people are using our product for long periods. Can we actually reverse the age of the skin in humans? So in order to do that, we need to collect biopsies because in order to measure the skin biological age, we needed to uh, run a methylation assay that we need the DNA to evaluate what's the methylation pattern and then run through an algorithm and determine the skin biological age. So for this study, we've done a pilot uh, that we did for 12 months and was a very small study that we almost saw significant, but we saw already a decrease in 3.3 years on average on the age of the skin. And now we, are, we just concluded a larger study with the 26 participants, so we expect to see a decrease in the skin biological age in six months. Uh, so we just concluded the study. We are still running uh, the, the methylation uh, assays, and uh, we hope to have these results soon. But uh, only from this pilot study is already very interesting to show that we can actually measure this decrease in the skin biological age. It, can, it definitely can take more time, up to 12 months potentially. But uh, even if you can show that instead of aging one year, you are reducing the age in 3.3 years, in 12 months, you're still gaining 2.6, 2.3 years. So uh, that's very exciting. I think no other company has done this kind of assessment. And uh, it shows that uh, it is possible to reverse the age of the skin in a healthy way, in a safe way that doesn't cause, doesn't make your skin irritated, inflamed, or cause peelings. Uh, so yeah, we are excited. We're excited to have the results of this one soon. Yeah, that, that is exciting. Uh, you're using a skin specific clock, right? For the, yeah. for the age measure. Yeah. But also we, we, we measure on our clock, which we develop in order to be the most accurate because it was trained only with the skin samples. But the, for the, the study that we published, we also validating in several, six other clocks. So clocks from Horvath, from um, Morgan Levine, uh, so we know that the trend of decreasing is also validating in other in other clocks, even though if the uh, uh, the specificity is different, but uh, the trend is it's reproducible. Excellent. In human trials, is it is it also possible to look at the chemical composition? Like, is there more hyaluronic acid, or can, can you look at that in human trials, or is that kind of too difficult? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's very challenging. I'm I'm thinking if there are so, there are some equipment equipment that can measure the uh, that can get images a little deeper in the skin and can try to quantify the percentage of collagen. Um, and the best way that it we could do that is with the biopsy. So mm. we do this a lot in the lab in a way that we, when we get skin samples that we, we use for our studies, we can do the skin treatments in two ways. One, we can grow 3D skins using cells from donors, but we can also get skins that are 
supplied by uh, surgeries like clinical clinics that are running plastic surgeries. And um, when we treat the skins in the lab and we run, uh, we can stain the collagen and we can quantify the amount of collagen mm. in depending on the treatment. For example, even when we're exposed to UV, uh, UV light, we see that degrades collagen. And then when we treat with some of our products, we see that that collagen is restored. So in vitro, it's easier to quantify <laughs> that amount of like collagen or hyaluronic acid. In humans, it's a little more tricky unless you are getting biopsies and people don't like to be biopsied. So <laughs> uh, that's why we try always to correlate the in vitro data with like clinical outcomes, but in a way that, okay, if we see this in vitro, that should correspond to this kind of improvement in, in the clinical setting. And usually we, we, we get a very high correlation, but because we know that each analysis or has its own limitations. So we, that's why in the end, we combine all the data to get to the final assessment. Mm -hmm.